Thank you all for being here. I'm Elizabeth Overton, Development Director for Cameron Art Museum, and it's great to see so many great faces with us this evening. We're glad you're here for an evening with CAM's new Executive Director, Heather Wilson, in conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. In conversation with Rhonda Bellamy, President and CEO. Yeah. Yeah. Rhonda is the president and CEO of the Arts Council of Wilmington and New Hanover County and the chair of Arts North Carolina. And we're, it's a privilege for all of us tonight to include you um, at CAM for an insider's perspective as we enter a new era of, of opportunity for our community with dynamic leadership. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Rhonda, for being here tonight to carry on these conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Can I ask all of our volunteers to stand up. If you are currently a volunteer at Cameron Art Museum, or if you have been a volunteer at Cameron Art Museum, can you please stand? And that, that includes board members. Can I also ask all of my staff to stand? These are the people who make it happen, y'all. We are so grateful for each and every one of you. I just wanted the community to see the people behind the scenes, the people who really make the magic happen. I am so terribly honored to be asked to have this conversation with you. We've had a number of conversations over the years. And of course, I have more than a passing in interest in Cameron Art Museum. I'm a two-time board member, including being on the board when we moved into this fine facility. Uh, I was uh, brought on the board for an additional two terms and uh, resigned the board only to take on the role of the executive director as, of the Arts Council, and we didn't want there to be any conflict of interest. I see Fran Goodman, our former chair, Woo! board chair. Hey, Fran. <laughs> and Heather, I think I want to start by asking, who is Heather Wilson? That is not a question that I expected. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I thought we were just going to talk about the museum. We are, but you know, I think it's really interesting because you have been here September 1, as I understand, makes 17 years that you have been here at this museum. First yeah. as development director and then as the deputy director and now as the executive director. And it has been just um, so wonderful to see you grow with this museum. So who is, tell us who you are as a person. Thank you, Rhonda. Well, I will also say that on September 1st, Georgia Mastroini, our Director of Outreach and Accessibility, will also be celebrating 17 years at Cameron Art Museum because we started on the same day. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, <laughs> woo, Georgia. And by way of uh, introducing myself, I'll tell you something about me that um, maybe you might know, you might not know, but I actually started at Cameron Art Museum as the yoga teacher. <laughs> and I don't put that on my resume. I was working at the Dream Center for Arts Education. I am from Salisbury, North Carolina. I went to UNC Chapel Hill, majored in English, minored in creative writing, and I wanted to work in publishing. So I moved to Boston after graduation um, and got a great job. I worked first at the Atlantic Monthly. So lucky to be able to work there back when uh, people really read print magazines. I still do, and I bet many of you do too. And then I got kind of my dream job at the time, working in the trade division at Houghton Mifflin Company. So I got to meet people like Philip Roth in the elevator. I mean, imagine what that was like for a 22-year-old, right? I, you know, I'm holding my coffee and I, wow. <laughs> but then, you know, after a couple years doing that, I really wanted to write. Um, I'm a writer and I love storytelling and I think that's part of what drives me here at Cameron Art Museum because everything we do is related to a story. It's related to your story. It's related to the story of who we are in New Hanover County. It's related to the story of who we are in the United States and, and really it connects, I think, art 
exists to connect our stories, right? To connect us with our shared humanity. So I moved to Wilmington uh, really because of Philip Gerard. Um, I imagine that many of you knew Philip. He passed away last year, which is something I'm still adjusting to. Um, I came to get my MFA in creative writing. I am a fiction writer. It's hard to make a living that way. But you know what? Grant writing is kind of like fiction writing. <laughs> so I started, after graduation, after I finished my thesis, I worked at Dreams downtown, an organization that really still has my heart. I taught writing there. And on the side, I taught yoga at Cameron Art Museum. Uh, one of my volunteers at Dreams told me that they needed someone in development. And so I came here and, you know, the rest is, as they say, history. I fell in love. Um, I fell in love with this community and I fell in love with this unique way of storytelling. You know, Mike Williams, who's here, talks about it too, right? We put together these objects that, you know, may or may not seem like they connect. We put together artworks and we're able to tell a story that connects our audiences not only with the art and with the artists, but with each other. And that's one of the power, most powerful things that I see happening on a daily basis here at Cameron Art Museum. I see people come to the museum and be transformed. And I'm not making this up, y'all. It happens every day. Um, I see people connect with strangers. I see people connect more deeply with loved ones. Um, how many of you saw Diane Landry's Flying School when it was here? Okay, so for those of you who don't know about Diane Landry's Flying School, it's in our permanent collection, so you'll get to see it again. But Diane Landry is a Canadian artist. She's a kinetic artist. Um, and her work, I don't even know how to explain it, y'all. Flying School is a series of umbrellas of different sizes that open and close in a dark room and they have lights on them. I see a lot of you, right? Okay, they're like, yes, light bulb. I know that work. They make these haunting sounds. And we had a father and a son come into the museum when Flying School was up. And the father had been deployed, he had been away. He had missed connecting with his son for, you know, who knows how long. You could tell, our visitor services desk told us that you could tell that their relationship was a little bit awkward, right? They were reconnecting with each other. And they chose to come to Cameron Art Museum. So they went into the Brown Wing, and they didn't come out for a really long time. So security went to check on them, and they were laying down on the floor in flying school, having this moment together, one of those moments that I think is made possible by the space, by the people in it, by the artworks in it. So that was not really answering your question, Rhonda. <laughs> I'm a yoga teacher, I'm an art lover, <laughs> I'm a writer, but I'm also a mother. Um, my two children will probably come in in a little bit. My oldest is running his first cross-country meet of the season tonight. Yeah. <laughs> so we've been in this facility for 20 years now. Mm -hmm. You've been here for 17 of those years. And I imagine that as you decided that this is, I, I want to go for the executive director position, that you had a vision of how things that you would do. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think my biggest focus coming into this role as executive director is accessibility and inclusivity. Um, some of you may have seen, we just got a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Yay. It's a two-year grant that will allow us to first gather together a group of community experts, uh, folks who, um, in the accessibility field, um, who can help to advise us to move forward with accommodations and new programming and outreach designed to reach everyone. Uh, we're, we'll be working on bringing art to those who are blind and low vision, those who are deaf and hard of hearing, uh, folks who might uh, be neurodiverse, those who are differently abled, we are looking to, to make sure that the museum is a safe and welcoming space 
for everyone. I don't know if you know, know it or not. I, I imagine that most of you do, because I'm talking to a lot of people who are in the know and who are kind of our key stakeholders. Uh, but one of the first programs that I was able to find funding for when I started here was the Connections Program. Have any of you been volunteers or have worked with the Connections Program? Right, so Lorraine and Bobby. Uh, the Connections program is a program that we offer on Mondays when the museum is cl uh, closed to the public. And we offer special guided tours. Lorraine was on the advisory committee when we started this program. We've been doing it for about 15 years. Uh, to those who are living with Alzheimer's and dementia and also their caregivers. So they have a special experience in the galleries when the public isn't here. Um, and oftentimes we have therapeutic music. So back to that vision, right? What am I gonna do different? I think I am standing on the shoulders of giants. I am here to honor the past. I'm here to honor St. John's and who we have been. Um, and then to continue our focus on making sure that Cameron Art Museum is here for everyone. And when you say Cameron Art Museum being here for everyone, I think that it's important that we make the distinction that we are running three or four different businesses <laughs> in this facility. Yeah. So there is the museum proper, mm -hmm. there is a restaurant, mm -hmm. there is a school, mm -hmm. it's used as a gathering place for organizations that are arts affiliated or not. Yep. Um, so n realizing that you study museum trends quite a bit, what are we seeing in terms of uh, museums and their evolution? particularly post-COVID? That's a really great question. So post-COVID, people found that museums were some of the safest places that people felt to go, right? We have really high ceilings here. We have state-of-the-art ventilation, and you could come and be in a group, but also feel like you had space, right? So we've seen across the country that museums opened, they opened carefully, but They've, they've seen a comeback from the communities across the country. In terms of trends in the museum, I think accessibility, inclusiv inclusivity, and equity are all major national trends that uh, we are a part of. This idea that we exist to be a cultural gathering place is not new, we didn't invent it. Um, it really comes from best practices in the field and what's happening around us. Yeah. So what's happening around us is that CAM had 62,863 visitors mm -hmm. in the fiscal year ending June 30. Mm -hmm. 8,974 children mm -hmm. visited the museum and 1,224 1, museum school students. That's incredible. How do you, are you at capacity? What do you need mm -hmm. to go further? That is a great question. Uh, this is the highest attendance we've ever had. Y'all are doing great work. <laughs> you saw a portion of our fleet of volunteers. Our volunteers make the museum run. We have a fleet of interns from UNCW and Cape Fear Community College. Are we at capacity? No, I don't think we're at capacity at all. It is a challenge. And um, as our director of development often says, and I love it when she says it, she says it's a work in progress, right? We're figuring out ways to meet our community where it is, and we're here. We want to be relevant. We want to be important. Uh, we also know from a fiscal perspective that to be successful, we have to continue to get more people through the door, more people eating in the cafe, more people buying things in the shop, and more people taking classes. It's just the reality of who we are. What we have here in Wilmington, what the community has created is very unique. We are an art museum with no umbrella institution. We do not receive regular city, county, state, university funding. We're an anomaly, but that's an opportunity, y'all. We are here because the community wanted an art museum. Our community was passionate enough. We saw what was happening down the road um, at the North Carolina Museum of Art in the 40s. We saw what happened in Greenville. And, and in 1962, we were like, we want to do that. We're not going to do a feasibility study. 
we're just going to make an art museum happen. And we've done that, and I think against the odds. And so I, we're not at capacity. We're just going to keep uh, growing and responding and meeting the community where it is. But it takes money to run a building of this mm -hmm. size. I remember being on the board, and without trying to reveal any proprietary information, <laughs> and uh, Charles, Fran, you have to tell me if I'm out of line. But I remember going through us looking over the budget and the light bill each Ooh, month. <laughs> so our CFO, Kendall Walter, is right there. <laughs> she can tell you, oh gosh, Kenda, $12,000 $12, a month. That's electricity, $12,000 a month, right? Overhead is, is big for a 42,000 square foot building that this community <laughs> decided to build. So the community has to help us to sustain this, and they do. So I understand that you have uh, created a few programs, additional programs, um, to in further engage people in the area. And I, I thought about this um, as I was coming over, and I thought about how transient the employment trend is. Mm. You know, people are not working necessarily um, from the towns that they live in. Yeah. They might be someplace else. So how do you engage people given this mm. employment climate? That's a great question. That's one that Elizabeth and I think about all the time, right? Um, I meet people all the time who, I met a lawyer last night, y'all. He's not here. Um, he lives here in Wilmington, but he works in Denver. I was like, how does that work, really? Um, <laughs> um, Kathy Lindenmeyer, who's on our board, she lives here sometimes, but she works in Memphis. Uh, we have a lot of folks who work for big IT firms. Uh, they live here because it's a beautiful place, right? So I think that's a question that Matt Budd, our director of marketing, is always asking. We're trying to figure that out. Uh, we just got a grant from Art Bridges. Do you guys know about Art Bridges? It's the foundation. <laughs> Jenna's like, yeah, I wrote that. <laughs> Uh, Art Bridges is the foundation uh, that's associated with Crystal Bridges, which is a museum in Arkansas that is funded by Walmart. And Art Bridges is helping us to promote um, and have some programs connected to the Love Exhibition this fall. They're helping us to think about different ways to connect with folks, including we're putting some ads on Spotify, um, right? Trying to think about different ways. And so we're really lucky that we have institutions across the country that help to push us and motivate us and think about different ways to engage with our population. Yeah. So the 2022-2023 fiscal year also saw 10 exhibitions being mounted here at Cameron Art Museum, including the much beloved State of the Art Art of the State. <laughs> Are there plans to do this every two, three years? I mean, I know it's a massive undertaking. What a great question. <laughs> Why, yes, Rhonda, there are plans. We tend to do state-of-the-art art of the state every four years. I think it takes our staff about four years to recover from staying up for 24 hours straight. Um, you can look for state-of-the-art art of the state in 2026, but there are going to be some twists on it. And that's about all I'm going to say. I think we're going to do some things that are new and different and exciting. Um, for those of you that don't know, state-of-the-art art art of the state is a 24-hour happening. We invite artists from across the state of North Carolina, like Catherine Young, to come and bring us the work of art. The only requirement, really, is that it has to fit in our door. Um, and we have had people like saw off legs of their sculptures to get it in. <laughs> so people drive from Asheville, they drive from Brevard, they drive from Charlotte, they drive from Raleigh, they come here and they get to wait in line for five to seven hours with <laughs> like-minded people, have a party in the parking lot. That party goes all the way to Independence last year. We had 776 artists last year, y'all. It was incredible. We hung art until there was no space left 
in the Hughes Wing. Um, it's an incredible experience. The artists get to meet with a nationally known curator and have a very short critique. So this last time we had a curator from the Met, we had the cur a curator from Crystal Bridges, and a curator from the High Museum of Art. So we'll be doing that again in 2026. So prior to 2026, what other exhibitions do you have planned? So much good stuff. You know, I was thinking about this um, today because Kenda Walter, our CFO, when we talk about our kids, she always says every age is the best age. And I feel that, of course, about my children, but also about the exhibitions in the museum. Y'all, if you haven't seen Love, which is an adaptation of an exhibition that was at the High Museum of Art, it is so good, and I'm going to be so sad when it's gone, but it's leaving October 8th, and man, have we got a great show coming. Um, on November the 9th, uh, we will have the member opening for Monument, which is an exhibition that was funded by the National Endowment for the Arts, featuring national and internationally known artists Kara Walker, Sonia Clark, and Allison Saar, even Stephen Hayes is making a brand new work for us. Um, he's using some of the plaster cast that he had left over from Boundless and is making us a new work. So Monument pushes against, confronts, and questions uh, the role of commemoration in our physical environment in the United States. It's going to be a great show. I'm really excited about it. But that's that's not the only show I'm excited about it. In February, we'll open a show called The Work of Their Hands. Bobby Fitzsimmons is so excited because she's a quilter. And yay! <laughs> I'm, so Faith Ringgold, an artist we know and love, yes. right? We'll have work in that collection. We're using a, a quilt from our collection as an anchor work. It's a special quilt. Uh, it's a tulip quilt made in the 1840s. I think that's right. It's so beautiful, y'all. It was made by an unknown enslaved woman, and now it lives in our collection. That work is the anchor work, and from that work, we spiral out and look at how quilt making has changed, how contemporary quilt making is continuing to change. One of the things I'm excited about is that... Um, Bobby, who's on our board, will also be uh, bringing us some quilts from an organization that she works with called the Advocacy Project, which will be in the show. Bobby travels the world. She just got back from Kenya working with women to embroider their stories on quilts. So that will be part of the show. I wanted to show everyone, this is a book that will soon be for sale in our shop. It's called the COVID stitch. I don't know, did anyone here participate in the COVID quilt project that we had during the pandemic? I think a couple people at September did, Bobby did. We asked our community to create quilt squares. Bobby sewed them together and we had an exhibition in the reception hall where we juxtaposed our stories in the Cape Fear region with stories from people who lived in Nepal, um, who lived in Zimbabwe um, and found those connections, right? Our shared humanity between our stories and stories nationally, how people were, were coping with COVID. Okay, one more, one more exhibition I'm excited about, Rhonda, and then I'm done, I promise. April, April 24th, we open an exhibition by North Carolina artist Thomas Sayre. Do you guys know the big earth cast at NCMA? If you've ever, yeah, okay, lots of people are shaking their heads. If, you're, if you don't know, I'm sure you're gonna go home and Google it. Thomas Sayre is an incredible North Carolina artist. He is a profoundly deep thinker, uh, a talented artist who will have um, a show in, in the Hughes Wing called Four Walls. And it's work, uh, some of it is work that has never been shown before. And we are really, really lucky to be able to show that here. He's also been working with singer-songwriter Tiff Merritt, and she will be here to perform in the galleries. Wonderful. So let's talk about the collection for a minute. How large is the collection? So we have about 4,400 objects in the collection now. It has grown by leaps and bounds since we moved here. Uh, when we moved into Cameron Art Museum 21 years ago, I think we had about 1,500 works. Um, 
The story of our collection is one that I love to tell, and it's one that many of you have probably heard me tell if you went on one of my tours when 60 plus, that exhibition was up. Um, but yeah, it's, the collection is near and dear to our heart. You can see one of our latest acquisitions. Actually, when you leave the reception hall on your left, Bob just hung a new piece that we just acquired um, by Clarence Hayward there. Yeah. Cameron Art Museum decided to lean into the fact that you are on an historic site. Mm -hmm. And so you've received, uh, you're not just an art museum now, you're an art and history museum for all intents and purposes. Do you plan to continue to lean into that? Yeah, this is a story that I feel that we have a moral obligation to tell. We sit on a historic Civil War site where 1,820 African-American men fought for their freedom. And from that story, we were able to receive a Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation Inclusive Public Arts Grant. We were able to commission Stephen Hayes, who teaches at Duke University, woo, <laughs> uh, to make a work named Boundless. Um, and it has been one of the most transformational um, things that I think has happened to the museum. Uh, because of the sculpture, we received coverage in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Um, but more importantly, y'all, people travel from across the country to see this sculpture um, and to hear the story. And so we're leaning into that, and we will continue to lean into that. Daniel Jones, who's not here tonight, but is usually here, and he gives a tour on Fridays at one that's so good. He's our cultural curator. And I got a IMLS grant uh, to hire him so that he could bridge that gap between the historic site and the work of the museum. We choose to interpret history through art. And through that lens, I think we are able to tell a story that is approachable and accessible to almost everyone, any, anyone. And so some of the programs that Daniel curates are things like our Sunset Concert Series, where you can come and hear music at the site, but we also talk a little bit about the site and the importance of the site. Daniel does a lot of tours, and this November, on November 11th, we're having our first USCT Descendants Day. As part of that, we are creating a documentary. We are interviewing descendants of the United States Colored Troops, and the stories we are learning, these stories that have existed in the margins, stories that have yet to be told in a public forum are so inspirational and so important and connect us deeply to each other. You and I have talked over the past month or so about ways to engage the community, how they can become a greater part of this fine facility. Let's talk about some of them. Uh, Executive Director Circle, is it? Oh, why yes. <laughs> we are. So Frances Goodman, who I think you've heard about a couple times, she's here. Uh, Frances has been our board chair in the past, and she's coming back on the board. Uh, she has I asked us. first. <laughs> Did I not? Okay. I hope it's okay to publicly announce that. <laughs> We're getting a press release together. Um, <laughs> we, she, Frances has been generous enough to, um, she's hosting a party for us, October 19th, and we're founding the, our first ever director circle. Um, and if you want to learn more about the director circle, we'd love to tell you about that. Elizabeth would love to talk to you. The director circle is a group of upper level members who help to contribute to the bottom line, to our general operating expenses. We are currently facing about a $300,000 funding gap. Um, one that we know we can address with the help of our community. We are looking to diversify our funding um, and the director's circle is a major aspect of that. All right. So we're going to take a few questions from the audience. Amy? What is your greatest need and how may we help? Oh, Amy. 
Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You know, I would say that our greatest need right now is, is fiscal. You know, I think, and I don't say that to intimidate any of you. We are a community-funded museum. Our umbrella institution is the community. So there are lots of ways that you can help. You can come eat in the cafe. We had a nice wine tasting a couple weeks ago, right? Susan was there, and people kept saying, you mean if I buy this bottle of wine, I'm helping the art museum? And I said, why, yes, you are. <laughs> but I would say I would encourage each of you to join. Membership is the number one way that you can help us to survive. And then just come. Come be a part of this community. Shop in the shop. Take classes. Come to Jazz at Cam. There's lots of great things that are happening here, and we would love to welcome you to be a part of those things. How many organizations do you partner with each year? Whew. In Georgia, what do you think? Close to 100? Yeah. So Georgia Masterini is our Director of Outreach and Accessibility, and she runs uh, one of my favorite groups of partners, which is our Education Committee. And we, that Education Committee helps to inform the education work that we do, and it includes representatives from Smart Start, Smart Start Youth Development Organizations, UNCW, uh, Cape Fear Community College, New Hanover County Schools. But we don't stop at New Hanover County Schools. I spent some time this summer driving to Duplin County to meet with folks at Duplin County Schools. We meet with Pender County Schools. We serve an eight-county radius and provide arts education and field trips for, for children um, and adults in eight counties. Um, we work with a lot of institutions. Today we had the Wilmington Housing Authority was here for a staff meeting. We've been partnering with the Wilmington Housing Th Authority for at least 20 years. Uh, Georgia sometimes goes on site to teach classes or we bring kids here. We always have scholarships available in the summer for young art students who live in the Wilmington Housing Authority. So if you're interested in helping us with that, you can talk to Elizabeth, our Director of Development, or I'll tell you a secret. There's another way to help with scholarships to museum school. You can take yoga on Tuesday at Cameron Art Museum at 9 a.m. and those proceeds go to help us to get scholarships for those children. Well, I was going to ask about the availability of scholarships because uh, we have a world-class museum school, but if you are not of means, yeah. it's you know unaffordable. Yeah. So tell us about scholarship opportunities. Yeah, so for a long time, our yoga instructors have um, allowed our by donation classes for part of those proceeds to go to uh, scholarships through the museum school for children in need, but we also do yearly campaigns to raise money, um, not only for children, but also for adults. So if you know someone, um, if you're interested in learning more, the person to talk to is September Kruger. She's our director of lifelong learning, and she can help you with that. All right. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Hi there. That's a good question. That's Sabina. a great question. And so I would say if you could stay after and talk with myself and Georgia Masterini, our Director of Outreach and Accessibility, we would love to talk with you and meet you where, we, where you are. Um, we do serve this eight county radius and we're always looking for new inroads. The school system is an easy way. 
I mean, it's not necessarily easy, but, but it's a way that we can impact a large group of people at once. And so I would like to say a little bit about what we do with schools. We offer free professional development for teachers in the eight county radius, using teaching uh, teachers how to use arts integration, which is a proven method to help to close the achievement gap. And we do those trainings at least twice a year. We also have educators nights that are free for teachers in the eight county radius where they can come here, they can hang out with us, have a glass of wine and a snack on us and have tours of the gallery and learn about our lesson plans. We publish lesson plans that are available for teachers too, but I would love to talk with you. Um, and Georgia would too, so thank you. Did I just see a back to school guide? Why, yes, we do have a back to school guide. <laughs> I'll tell you, we did not. <laughs> we, it's your response that makes people think that we, you know, scripted this before we, that did not happen. I did not even write out a single question. <laughs> Somebody told me that we needed to be fascinating, so I'm just being goofy. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we do. Every year we publish a school program guide, and that outlines for teachers, but also homeschool parents, all the opportunities that we have, including free opportunities for teachers and for students and for parents to connect with Cameron Art Museum. I will say we do have four free community days a year, uh, and our next one is coming up on September 25th. We'll be bringing in a troupe of Aztec dancers from the Triangle area with artist Rodrigo Dwarfman. The Aztec dancers will be dancing outside at 2 o'clock on September 24th, and Rodrigo Dwarfman will be giving a gallery talk in place of encounters at 3.30. So going back to Sabina's question, is there the possibility for satellite sites perhaps in some of the outlying counties? If we could find the funding, I'd be open to it. You know, that's a tough one, I think. And I'm feeling the gaze of my CFO over there, right? <laughs> $12,000 a month, Heather. <laughs> I think we have to shore up what we're doing here first. Um, and then that would be great. Let's do it. All right. Susan? It's huge. Yeah, so right now, um, I don't know if you guys know this, but all fourth and eighth grade students in the state of North Carolina study North Carolina history. So right now, we are bringing all eighth graders in New Hanover County to the museum to learn about this story that happened in their backyard that I can tell you, I certainly had never heard of the United States Colored Troops until I came to work here at Cameron Art Museum. And it has been a deepening and deepening and deepening of understanding of that impact and how important that story is. September Kruger, who's right there, wrote an incredible, incredible lesson plan guide. How many lessons are in that guide, September? Eight lesson plans for K through 12. Uh, that those are free and you can download them on our website. September did this brilliant thing where she took core curriculum, right? North Carolina standard course of study and connected the story of Boundless. Not only did she connect North Carolina standard course of study to the story of Boundless, but she also found a way to thread those uh, core standards through works from our collection that also connect to that story. Woo! <laughs> AI. Ooh, girl. I don't know if I want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Not, let's do it. oh, that's an excellent question. That's. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to make its mark on the art world in some shape or form. How are we preparing for that? What are we prepared for? If something is computer generated, I, I saw something today, in fact, 
about a court case where the court argued that this was not generated by a human, it was generated by a computer, and so there is no authentic authorship. Mm. How are we going to deal with these types of issues? That's something the museum world is, is talking about, right? Um, and, and we see new information about that all the time. One of the avenues that I'm most interested in and I think that I'm most curious about is that there are some artists who are working with AI you know, kind of in tandem to make new works of art. And I think that's really exciting, right? We've got to embrace new technology. We've got to see where it's going to take it, take us. And I think that there are creative potentials that we may not understand yet, but I tell you what, the people to follow are the artists. Yeah. When you're determining what types of exhibitions you're going to bring into the museum, what, what are some of the things that you look at? Is there a, a cost consideration? What, what really caps what you're able to bring in? That's a great question. So yes, first and foremost, there is a cost consideration. I would say that our exhibition budget has not increased a whole lot in the 17 years I've been here, which is, which is kind of disappointing, y'all. Uh, one of the things that we have to think more and more about in the museum world is equity. This is something Mike Williams has talked with me about too, right? Are we paying our artists? Museums historically have not paid artists. We think, oh, it's such an honor for you to have your art here in, in uh, an art museum and to juxtapose if you're a new and upcoming artist with an established artist. So, so that's something that I think we've got to consider um, moving forward. But the financial constraints are real, right? So when we start thinking about an exhibition, we think about what's relevant in the field, what's happening across the country, but we also think about what's relevant in the community. And then we always ask this question, how is telling this story going to contribute to the museum field? You know, that's something I think a lot of people may not know that that's part of the process. At Cameron Art Museum, we're also always thinking about ways to plug in works from our permanent collection because we don't have a permanent collection gallery, but we do want to showcase work from our permanent collection. So if you walk through Love right now, you will see work by Dixon Settler, you'll see work by Fritzi Huber and Leanne Truong. Those are all artists whose work are in our permanent collection. So those are some of the things we think about. I will tell you, sometimes we're just motivated by all and wonder and like with Thomas Sayre, I had the opportunity to go visit his studio and was blown away by this work of art that he had made during the pandemic that was inspired by a Renaissance altar and I could see it. It's going to be huge. I could see it right then and there. You know, it was on the floor in his studio, but I could see it in the Hughes Wing. So the collection also con contains works by some of um, the luminaries from this area. Claude Howell, Minnie Evans, Mary Cassette at one time. So when people come to the museum and they're not able to see it, tell us, explain to us the process by which you have to take work down so that it doesn't fade or be overexposed, for lack of a better term. That's a really great question. So. Um, when we think about our collection, there are a couple core themes and core types of work in our collection. We have a large holding of works on paper, which I've always thought was odd because works on paper don't do great in humid environments. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are, right? Uh, works on paper have to rest. And so that's something that people ask a lot. Well, where are the Mary Cassatts? I want to see the Mary Cassatts. My first introduction to St. John's Museum of Art was that I saw the Mary Cassatts on display at the MFA Boston when I lived in Boston. But those, that, those works that we love, we want to keep them bright and brilliant. So they have to rest. Other than Cameron Art Museum, what's your favorite museum in the country? Uh, in the country or in the world? <laughs> let's, yeah, let's stay in the country for oh. a minute. <laughs> okay, we're gonna stay in the country. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I'm a sucker for the North Carolina Museum of Art. I love it. I love the People's Collection. I absolutely adore it. Um, I also like the Cape Fear Museum. <laughs> 
I like the Children's Museum. Um, I love going to the Met. I love going to MoMA. Um, I love uh, the, the new African American Museum at the Smithsonian. My favorite museum in the entire world is the Tate Modern. Uh, without the Tate Modern, I would not be sitting here working in a museum. And you studied in Oxford for a while, right? Is that correct? I did, yeah. Um, is there a difference between European museums and American museums? Yeah, you, there is. Um, they have so much history that we don't have, right? And that connection to, to their past and, and things that have come before them. Um, I, think, I think that's a big part of it. Well, that aside, is there a, a curatorial style that's different? I mean, they, are, they have the masters there. We, we get that. What about the uh, public-facing part of the museum is different than what we do, the way we do things here? That's a great question. I don't know that I'm qualified to answer that question because most of the museums that I've been to in other countries are those big museums that I would compare to something like the Met or MoMA. And you know, one of my other favorite museums is the Guggenheim Bilbao. Um, there is an aspect, I think, of a museum in Europe, and not that I've been to Europe in a long time, Rhonda. <laughs> that's, that's different, right? She's got soccer practice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, country. So I don't know that I can, I can truly answer that question in an educated way. But I will tell you that what hit me in the gut at the Tate Modern, the show that I, well, there were a couple shows that I loved when I studied at Oxford, but there was an exhibition. It was a Matisse-Picasso exhibition, and they had British writers write the label copy to write, write, what? I mean, for a bibliophile like myself. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> it blew my mind. Any other questions from the audience? Well, thank you for joining us tonight. I see a hand getting ready to go up. That's a great question. So the person that you're sitting closest to is our registrar. <laughs> Susan Wisnett is our registrar and she is the keeper of all archival things. Uh, most of what's in our archival collection has to do with the works in our permanent collection. Um, however, we do have a lot of information connected to St. John's and the exhibitions that were at, at St. John's. We're also home to the Minnie Evans Study Center. So we have our just we're so blessed to have uh, ephemera and letters uh, and transcripts of interviews connected with many Evans. We're also home of the Claude Howe papers. So Claude Howe started keeping a journal when he was 10 years old and kept a journal his whole life long. Y'all, I think one of my lifelong goals is to read all of those journals because every time I pick up one and start to read, it's so juicy. Yeah, he's it's so good. Quite a colorful character <laughs> if you knew Claude Howell, <laughs> for sure. Will there be other questions? Yes. Not a question, but a comment. Um, when did you gather up by the collectors that were part of the promises? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Does everybody know the exhibition he's talking about, the exhibition promise? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm preaching to the choir. Y'all are the best. Thank you. Yeah. I want to go back to a question that she asked, and then I'll get yours. And that is, how do you accession in? How do you decide who you're going to accession in? Mm, and, an and will there ever be an opportunity for a local collection? That's a great question. So we do have an acquisitions committee. Francis Goodman is on that acquisitions committee. Do we have any other acquisitions committee members here tonight? Um, so our acquisitions are generally vetted by a committee. When we think about acquisitions, we have to start with the knowledge base of what's come before us, right? And so we look at what our core collections are. We do have a core collection of North Carolina work. 
Uh, we have Dugtown Pottery, and we do have a lot of work by local artists and North Carolina artists. Uh, when we think about upcoming acquisitions, we're often thinking about what does our collection lack, right? So we knew um, at least five years ago that some of what our collection lacked was diversity. Uh, we are the first female artist whose work we received was we received two gifts from Minnie Evans in 1971. Um, but from that point on, you know, I think our collection was predominantly white men. Um, and so we have looked to think about ways to diversify the collection as kind of a, you know, a major goal for our collecting practice. There was, there you are. It's a great question. So uh, we talk to collectors all the time, and actually the person that you need to talk to is sitting right there in front of you. <laughs> Susan Wisnett is our registrar, and we often have the great pleasure of getting to go to collectors' homes and to see their work. And I there's nothing I enjoy more. Um, there's something really special about going to someone's home and to see uh, their collection. And then while looking at their collection, as you learned, uh, learning from Glenn and Florence Hardiman and Andy and Hatha Hayes, you learn about their life story. Uh, and there's something really remarkable about that. Um, so Susan's the person to talk to, or you can talk to me. Um, and, and that's kind of the way the relationship starts. Simone? I just want to say thank you for the two words that you mentioned first, accessibility and inclusivity. We have so the children are inclusive in the collection. Simone, thank you. Thank you. All right, I think we've exhausted the questions. You know, I can <laughs> <laughs> I can keep asking. <laughs> Rhonda and I could keep talking for a while. Forever. I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you. If you're thinking about, oh, I'm so inspired, I want to support Cameron Art Museum, well, I know an easy way you could do it. Go get dinner in the cafe or just get a drink. So our special tonight is a strawberry mojito. <laughs> and, and Bobby liked hers. Have a great evening, and thank you thank so you much. Thank you.